Greetings, everyone. Teching 101 here. Welcome to One Piece Chapter 1110 Review. I'm going to begin this chapter review by making a series of nonsensical noises with my mouth. I hope you will join in. Thank you. All right, then. Let's begin. One Piece Chapter 1110 Review, titled Planet Fall, or Falling Planets, or Falling Stars. The sky is falling. Chicken Little was right the entire time. We didn't listen. We didn't listen. All right, so two-week break was definitely warranted because holy crap, this chapter's insane. The double-page spread in this chapter, I am going to get, like... I am going to get it framed, and like, it's going to have the King treatment, right? Like, the awesome artwork of King I have over here in the corner, drawn by Stefan. Like, that double page spread is one of the most epic double page spreads I've seen in a while in One Piece. And we got some really, really good ones, but this one is like perfecto, like chef's kiss, all right? But we'll get to it when we get to it. We have a brand spanking new cover series we're going to discuss. In fact, I was a little confused last time because the first installment of this didn't even have the title of the cover series. It was just Onigashima sinks to the bottom of Wano. Well, to the bottom of old Wano, which is still technically on the island of Wano because of the earth and walls around Wano. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's all it was. It didn't actually say what the cover series was going to be about in general. Some people actually thought that was the title, though, because it was so confusing. People thought, like, the entire cover series is going to be Onigashima at the bottom of Wano, which to me doesn't seem like a very exciting, like, 30-chapter cover series, but who knows? Maybe Oda could have done something with it. Chapter 2 of Onigashima at the bottom of Wano. A koi fish swims into the eye socket of the old, uh, skull castle. And chapter 3, the koi fish discovers Kaido's booze stash. Chapter 4, it drinks it, and then that koi fish transforms into a new Kaido. That's how you get a Kaido! Okay, that actually would be an interesting cover series now I'm thinking about it but no we're not doing any of that no the title of the cover series is Oni Child Yamato and the Holy Inari Shrine Pilgrimage Uh, okay, so you have Yamato and you have Momonosuke. Momonosuke is, of course, now the Shogun. They're in the Flower Capital. They're on top of the palace, kind of overlooking the Flower Capital and all of Wano. And Yamato is there and just like, I'm going to be just like Odin and I'm going to go out to Wano and I'm going to see everything it has to offer. And uh, Momonosuke is there just kind of leaning on the ba banister of the balcony, just kind of like... Alright. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting because... Odin was Momonosuke's father, not Yamato's, right? So it's like if anybody was going to, you know, walk in Odin's footsteps to like journey around the country and really see what he saw and like like carry on the will, you, you'd assume like the way that it would work in a typical kind of manga, like the trope would be the son following in the footsteps of the father. But that's not what's happening here. Momonosuke's like, all right, you, you want to be like my dad. Okay, have fun. I got a country to run. I got paperwork to do. All right, I got stuff to do here. You want to go and travel around the country like my dad did? You go right ahead, right? This would be like, um, okay, this would be like if in Hunter x Hunter, you have Gone who wants to find his dad, but it's not like that at all. This would be like if in Hunter x Hunter, uh, Kilawa is like, Gone, I'm gonna find your dad and be a great hunter just like him, and then Gone is like, yeah, all right, you have fun with that. I'm gonna go off here and do something else. <laughs> Just like, it's like weird. So Yamato is beginning his journey. Uh, good luck to Yamato. And uh, actually, I'm really excited because there was a lot of regions in Wano that we didn't really focus on too much, like the Kibi region. So we might see a lot of that in Yamato's cover series here. So um, I'm sure the, the scabbards are going to join in as cameo appearances and maybe some other characters from Wano, maybe, maybe even some characters Oda wanted to include because I'm sure the notes and everything for Wano were massive and he just couldn't fit everything in the story. Uh, but here's an opportunity for that. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Okay, Godspeed, Yamato. All right, so getting into the actual chapter now. Oh, I have goosebumps. Okay, so giant lightning just spewing off of Egghead at this point, right? Now keep in mind, most of the Marines have been evacuated back on the ships. You know, from one from the order of nobody, a uh, Commodore or a lower rank is able to even see Saturn, so they evacuated from that. And then there's also the Buster Calls, so a lot of them are getting the hell out of there. So, uh, you know, a lot of them are on the ships just observing this, and it literally looks like the end of the world. It's just like apocalyptic, just lightning firing off. You see bluegrass 
badass riding the uh, cyborg giraffe in the water. And the giraffe looks really cute. It has its eyes just like, ah, oh, yeah, this is fun. <laughs> the world is ending. Ah, you know. So everyone's just kind of looking at the island and like, yeah, we're not, we're not going through that. We're not going over there. Let's just. I think if Bluegrass was smart, she would just be like, all right, uh, you know, uh, let, let's go over there. You know, hop hop. Let's let, let's like, yip yip. Let's let's go over here. <laughs> let's just get the hell out of here. Um, even the giants. You see the giants that uh, evacuated back to their ship. You have Atlas, Frankie, uh, Bonnie, and Kuma there. They're looking over and they're seeing this like, oh, uh, hope everything's okay. That, that don't look too good. All right, you know, there you go. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Um, you do see the ship of the giant warrior pirates. So I think the original ship was the Great Ericsson or the Great uh, Eric, something like that. No, it was Great Eric. Okay, that was the original name of their ship 100 years ago. I don't know if this is the same ship. I doubt it would be, but it looks very similar. Of course, named after Eric the Red, who was the father of Leif Erikson. Get it? Eric's son because the Vikings, well, a lot of in Norse culture, that was pretty common to be like Eric's son. Uh, in fact, Leif, er not Leif Erikson, uh, Eric the Red also had a daughter who was Leif Erikson's sister, and her name was Freya's Eric's daughter. Okay, so Eric's son, Eric's daughter, it was, yeah. So anyway, I don't know, I just wanted to bring that up. I forgot to bring it up a couple of chapters ago when the ship actually showed up, but that's not what you're here to know. Uh, but we see um, the Vikings, the Vikings, we, well, they are Vikings. We see the Giants and uh, the uh, Pacifista Mark III's just bombarding the Marine ships. Uh, one of the Pacifistas is firing a laser, another of the uh, Giants is firing an arrow, and it just hits the battleship, and it just explodes. So they're on the offensive there. There's this really, it's not that big of a panel, but it's just a shot of the giants walking through the jungles of Egghead, which are all mechanical, kind of. And you see um, Dory and Broggy there and some other giants walking behind them. Just that image of, like, these giants walking through this futuristic island. Like, the juxtapositioning here is just very interesting. Also, the idea that um, we see the size scale difference. Because we see a Mark III firing a laser and one of the giants is right next to the Mark III shooting a bow. And you see the giants are like d over double the size of the Mark III's, which are based off of Kuma, who is a buccaneer. So that gives you like the idea of the size difference here. Giants in One Piece are really big. I think on average, it's like around 18 meters. Dory and Broggy are a little taller than that. I think uh, Dory is slightly taller than Broggy, but yeah, they're like around 22, 23 meters tall, something like that, but on average around 18. And I think Oda confirmed that the shortest giant is around 12 meters, which is still pretty damn tall, right? So now though, that's not what you're here to see. Uh, cool to see the giants, but now we cut over to the Room of Authority in Marijua, where we see a Den Den Mushi that was kind of displaying uh, Vegapunk's message in the room, of course. You know, Vegapunk's up there like, there's a great message to tell the world! Uh, but we'll give it 10 minutes. Uh, brew me some coffee, you know? So we just see the Den Den Mushi that was left on in the Room of Authority playing the message on the wall. So you see Vegapunk there and everything like that, but, there's no one else in the room. All of the couches and the chairs in the room of authority. Which, you know what, now that I'm actually looking at the room, it's kind of empty. Like, there's just two couches and a chair. That's it, in the room of authority. I mean, I get it, you're like immortal yokai creatures. I'm sure the Garo say don't need to eat and sleep and drink or anything like that, but we see that they can. There's the Yon Cook's existence that proves that, right? We saw Saturn eating a sausage earlier, right? I'm, I'm just saying, like, if it's like, welcome, welcome to the Immortality Club. You will be the rulers of the entire world. Now spend most of your days in this giant cavernous empty room. It's like, shit, man, can we get a bar in here? Can we get, I mean, I guess there's a TV, but they got to wheel in the Den Den Mushy. Can, can we get a record player? Can we get a vending machine or something? A pool table, for God's sake. Air hockey or something. A basketball court. You know, give us something. There's so much wasted space here. Anyway, we see a summoning circle on the ground that's sparking, so clearly the other Gorosei all got up, and maybe, I don't know if they physically, like, drew the summoning circle, because that wasn't the case with Saturn. The summoning circle 
Michael just kind of appeared on Egghead when Saturn jumped from the ship to the shore. So, um, you know, clearly that doesn't need to be the case. Maybe they just all, maybe they all stood up and then held hands and we just didn't see that part. And then the summoning circle just appears like, oh, great Eam Sama, we summon your power. We will go to Egghead to help our brother. And then like a circle appears and they all jump in it. Or maybe be, because they're not, they're all named after planets, I've been seeing a lot of the memes of Sailor Moon. So all of the, uh, the Gorosei have like a, you know, uh, planet makeup and then it's like you know mars is is doing like the different shots and they're all dressed like sailor scouts by the end of it but they're a bunch of old dudes so that a lot a lot of funny stuff coming from that but um yeah the summoning circle is there now as a parallel to what this is, you know, we see the summoning circles at Egghead, we see the shadows appearing out of the circles as the other Gorosei are arriving. We also get the message being relayed by Vegapunk on the screen, like this is being stated over this. So let me cover that really quick. So Vegapunk is talking about his greatest new invention, instant coffee. Uh, yeah, I, I understand, I know, it's the, the, the Gorosei are arriving in these eldritch forms that are bringing about the apocalypse. And, and then we get that overlaid with, I have invented Vega Coffee, the greatest coffee known to mankind. We'll take just a mug of regular water here, and with a single drop of this particular liquid, instant, warm, spicy coffee. Uh, Vegapunk makes instant coffee in three minutes. And that's impressive, because my coffee maker takes five minutes to make coffee. So three minute coffee, that's not bad. So uh, Vegapunk's like, all right, well, that, anyway, that killed some time. Uh... How, how many more minutes left do we have before the message is relayed? And I guess it's Shaka says, well, you know, it, it wasn't exactly a strict deadline, but we have seven minutes left. And then Vegapunk's like, ah, okay, well, let's start as scheduled. Now, I don't know what that indicates when he says that. Let us start as scheduled. Even if they try to silence our broadcast, that, that amount of extra time won't be enough to stop us. So I don't know if that means we're gonna wait the other seven minutes and then do the announcement as planned, or it means, eh, let's just do it now. I think it probably means waiting the extra seven minutes, but Vegapunk might just be like, ah, three minutes is long enough. I'm sure everyone has their Den Den Mushies. We can do it now. I'm not sure, but that's all we get from the broadcast in this chapter. We, we don't get anything more than that, okay. So, the summoning circles appear. And if you zoom in, which I can on my fabulous tablet here, you can actually see in the summoning circles, it wasn't present last week, the smoke was covering it up, you do see different numbers on the summoning circles. So when Saturn first arrived, his summoning circle had a five in it. These ones have a four, a three, a two, and a one. Okay, now, um, that indicates to me that the Gorosei all have given numbers, uh, with Saturn being number five, and we're gonna get the other ones here because we see them emerging. They're in a set order. It literally just goes four, three, two, one in the order here, and we see who appears out of each one, all right? Um, I, uh, my theory on this is that the Gorosei did not all exist at the Void Century at once. Eam existed then, Eam Nerona, and then whenever happened to Eam and became immortal or something, or had these powers, uh, over the centuries recruited the Gorosei one at a time, okay? So each of the Garosei have titles um, that indicate their status as the leader of a particular section of the world government, like agriculture, justice, uh, environment, stuff like that. Saturn is scientific defense. Top man is justice, okay? So I assumed, like, okay... After Eam became the ruler of the government, maybe over the centuries, Eam was like, all right, I need someone to handle the agricultural aspect of this. I need someone to handle the economy of this, okay? I can't run an entire world government by myself, even though I am, I have magical powers and I'm immortal, I still need some people to help me out with this, right? And so over the centuries, recruited each of the Garosei individually, all right? And the order in which I assumed that they were recruited, I, I was very, very close, okay? I assumed uh, the first person to be recruited would have been, uh, and this might not be the case, by the way. They might have been all recruited at once and might just be given individual numbers, but this gives me the idea that, like, okay, 
Goro Say number one was recruited first, and then Goro Say number five, Saturn, was recruited last, okay, over the course of the last 800 something years that the world government has been in power, okay? So I assumed Venus Joro, Ethan Barron, was the first one to be recruited because he's the minister or the uh, godhead of the uh, finance or like the economy. So I was like, oh, control the money of the world might be the first thing to do it. But then I also thought, well, maybe agriculture, because that would also make sense. Well, in the order that these summoning circles are showing up, the order is number one would be Jew Peter, would be Shepherd Jew Peter, the minister or the godhead of agriculture. Then Ethan Baron Venus Juro, Venus, uh, would be number two. And then Top Man Warkry or uh, Valkyrie or Mercury would be number three of Godhead of Justice. And then four would be Marcus Mars of uh, Environment. And then you would have uh, St. J. Garcia Saturn, number five of Science and Defense. Okay, so that was basically, uh, aside from those first two, those were kind of the order I assumed it would go in. So you have Agriculture first, which does also make a lot of sense. Control the world's food supply. Then the economy. Then Justice which is probably where the Marines came from. And then I like to think there was a gap for a while, and then the environment came a little later, like conservation efforts and stuff, and then science and defense came last, because I think Saturn was recruited along the same time that the Iron Giant attacked Marie Joie 200 years ago. After the Iron Giant woke up and climbed the red line, maybe they were, maybe Eam was like, okay, we need another Garo say to manage science shit now, all right? Because we don't want this happening again. So then they recruited Saturn, okay? Maybe something like that. Could be completely off, but there are different numbers on the summoning circle. So each of the guards say do have a different number uh, given to them, like a designation, all right? So, um... Their forms first appear silhouetted, very much like the way that, you know, Sabo saw them at, uh, you know, uh, Marie Joie. Now, when Sabo did see them, I'm sure he saw their actual forms, not the silhouette. The silhouette's more for, like, being ominous, I guess, or Oda depicting them like, ooh, okay, everything like that. So Luffy's there and witnesses this, and Luffy in Gear 5th still is like, there's five of you monsters? Aw, oh, man, this is gonna be tough. <laughs> he doesn't say that, he's, but he's just like, there's five of you? Oh, Oh, come on! You know, it's like, and then we have Sanji running off with Vegapunk's corpse, just like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I need to call Nami. This is this is the end of the world, all right? So, um, we get the designation for each of the Garosei and their yokai that they represent, and then we have the most metal double page spread I've ever seen in my life, okay? So we have first and foremost, St. J. Garcia Saturn. We're well acquainted with this guy, and he is the Gyuki. Gyuki is another name for an Ushioni, all right? And also I looked into it, Ushioni, by the way, they like spider bodies, cow heads, yokai. They also fight with poison, which we did see that with um, Saturn. He uses like his spider appendages to like stab things and the poison melts. I'm sure the poison is more acidic and more devastating than anything Magellan could cook up, you know, maybe even stronger than Venom Demon, okay, something like that. Then we have Marcus Mars, who is the godhead of the environment, and he is an Itsumade. Itsumade, every time I've looked it up, like every description I've seen of the Itsumade, describe it as an eerie bird. So it's an eerie bird, and I wrote I wrote some stuff down here, so we'll do, we'll do some references there. Um, yeah, eerie, it makes really creepy cries, uh, apparently it's cry eyes bring illness to like it goes on top of a mountain and you hear this bird screeching in the night and then a bunch of people down in the village will get sick. Um, I also wrote down because they're written in kanji all except one of them and uh, the kanji of the Itsumade uh, actually this one is the most complex it includes four kanji and it's the first one is by means of or because like the kanji for the word because then you have the kanji for haven or port uh, like a harbor, then you have the kanji for truth, then you have the kanji for heaven or sky, ten, okay, so you have that. Then we have the third Garosei, Top Man, the godhead of justice, and he is a hokey. Hoki. It's basically a giant boar, okay? It's a boar, the kanji for seal and the kanji for boar, a uh, very devastating animal. I think it's actually more from Chinese mythology than Japanese mythology, but that's what he represents. Giant boar with the tusks coming out. We saw that his was one of the more obvious ones, although I think I said mammoth or something when uh, they, they saw the uh, silhouette at uh, Marie Joie when Sabo was fighting them. Um, I think I said, yeah, mammoth or something because of the tusks, but no, or elephant maybe. 
maybe. But no, it's a boar, giant boar. Um, and then we have uh, Ethan Baron Venus Juro, who is a uh, Bakotsu. A Bakotsu is just a skeleton horse. Now, this is honestly the most badass looking one, I gotta be honest with you, because it's clearly, like, undead. Like, these other things are, like, animals, like a bird, a boar, a spider, and then a worm we're gonna get to. But then you have Ethan Baron, who's just a skeleton horse. Like, the horse of death. The, the literal, like, the pale rider, okay? Just a skeleton horse. And I'm sure this thing lets out a scream that's just, like just chilling to the very bone, okay? Oh my god, Brooke needs to fight this thing. Actually, Brooke needs to fight uh, Ethan Baron for a few different reasons we're gonna get in a second, but I kinda wanna see Brooke riding on the back of this skeleton horse, all right? But uh, dude, this thing's scream. Have you ever seen that episode of, um, this, this, this note just keeps falling off, I don't even care anymore. Um, have you ever seen the episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog with the windmill vandals? And there's those skeleton vandals that are like the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then they have their skeleton horses. Yeah, there's some of the sound effects used in that episode. Maybe that's kind of what these things sound like, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's very terrifying. And the kanji for the Bokotsu is literally just the kanji for skeleton and the kanji for horse. That's it, or like horse skeleton, that's all, okay? So then, we have the one that's honestly the outlier out of all of them, and that's uh, Saint Shepherd Jupiter, or Jupiter, godhead of agriculture, and he is just a sandworm. Now, the translation here says sand uh, worm with like W-Y-R-M, like dragon. Uh, I think the origin of that, well, by the way, in case you're curious why worm sometimes means dragon, I think it comes from the term uh, Vierm. And I don't know if it's German or something, but yeah, it's German or something. Look, I don't know a lot about this, but I think it comes from a word called Vierm, which means like serpent. And then the serpent kind of got lumped in with dragon because dragons are kind of serpents, you know, and that's where that comes from. Anyway, um, sandworm kind of looks like Dune, the Dune sandworm, you know what I mean? Like, and uh, there, maybe the sandworm from Beetlejuice, remember that thing? Yeah, so sandworms kind of pop up all over the place, and uh, in, in more works of media than you would imagine. It's not just Dune, but yeah, so we have these like four mythical yokai kind of thing going on here like mythical spider with the head of a, a cow and then a mythical eerie bird and then a mythical giant boar with these huge tusks and then a skeleton horse and then just a sandworm and the sandworm's not written with kanji it's just a uh, katakana sandworm okay so Maybe, uh, maybe Shepard is the first Gorosei to be recruited. Maybe they get to choose. That would have been really funny if, like, all of the Gorosei, like, what form, like, Eam is like, what form do you desire to take? I can use my eldritch powers to grant you any form you desire. And then Saturn is like, I wish to be a Gyuki. I am the... Uh, Venus Juro is like, I want to be a cool skeleton horse of death. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then, you know, Saint Shepard, Jupiter, is just like, I want to be a sandworm. I just watched Dune last week. Seemed pretty cool. All right, you get to be a sandworm. I mean, it's not a bad choice. It's the it's the biggest one, I think, out of all of them. It's huge. So, yeah, all right, sure, why not, right? Well, they all appear, and then we get the double-page spread, the five elder planets, um, not the five elder stars, because the way that it's uh, Goro, Goro Sei, the way that, you know, Sei is written sometimes can mean stars, but in this case, definitely planets, because they're clearly, you know, based off of the planets. Um, this, is, uh, th this is a season of Sailor Moon, that I didn't know existed, guys. This is a little, this is a little scary. But my God, this double page spread. I need to get somebody to commission this, and I'm getting this framed, and I'm putting it somewhere in the office. This just looks so damn cool. Also, the idea that you have these like ancient yokai mythical beings appear on the future island. So you see, like, it, it really looks like I'd have seen like a Godzilla movie. Like the city is in ruins, and then these these kaiju keep popping up. You know what I mean? Like and destroy all monsters or something like that, right? It's just like this giant bird thing with like a neck it's like the giant claw like Aah! and they have this board that's like Aah! and then you have a spider that's just like Aah! and then you have this skeleton horse that's like Aah! and then you have a sandworm that's like I don't know what a sandworm sounds like. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's just like okay um damn that's cool and then Luffy's right there bouncing up on the ground in front of them all like Oh man, he's tiny. Luffy in Gear 5 is tiny. Now he can make himself bigger. I don't know how Luffy's gonna get out of this one. Luffy, I, I kinda wanna see what Luffy's first reaction's gonna be to this. Like, how to take out all five giant monsters at once. 
Huh. <laughs> All right, well, how about I turn into a giant, move my arms over, and then just pick up the ground and just just, just crush them all at once. So you can try that. I don't know. Um, well, what if Luffy like picks up the ground and starts bending it like a carpet? Like you're wringing out a carpet or something, and it's all wavy. And the Goro say all get knocked up. Well, okay. Well, the Goro say get knocked around, <laughs> and they're like, whoa, what? What's going on? And it's like that. I mean, that would be funny. That would be cool. Yeah. All right. Garo say are all business here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you what, there's no, there's no moment where they show up and they're like, ah, so this is the one you spoke about, Saturn. This is the sun god. There is no like, ah, Saturn, you have failed us. You are the runt of the litter. We, your older brothers, will handle it. There's none of that, okay? Now, maybe it might be because they're telepathic, so maybe they are having, maybe they're having that whole conversation right now and we just don't know about it. They show up. They get to business, all right? They just start moving. They don't talk to each other. They don't look around. They show up and they're, they're all in their full animal forms and they get moving. First thing, Ethan Baron in the skeleton horse uses some kind of clairvoyance ability, some kind of power to detect things around him and he senses where the pacifistas are. He runs off from the battlefield immediately, just bolts off, turns into his hybrid form, which is a skeleton horse centaur. Uh, I guess I didn't need to clarify horse there. Skeleton centaur. The lower half is the skeleton. The top half is still Ethan Baron. He takes out his sword, which could very well be the Shodai Kitetsu, hockeys that son of a bitch up, and then just starts slashing through the Pacifista Mark Threes, all right? Just cutting them apart. Uh, actually, not even, not even slicing them multiple times, just taking out the Shodai, hockeying it up, slicing one of them, and that's all it takes. Freezing power, probably similar to the freezing power of the underworld because he's an undead horse. We already know that with Brook. Brook's power, the Yomi Yomi no Mi, confirms that there's an underworld that exists in One Piece. Brook's soul is tethered to the mortal plane and he channels the power in the icy grip of the underworld in our mortal realm. Brooke is an abomination, but Ethan Barron seems to be on that same level, or even more of an abomination, all right? Because he's clearly like an undead being, right? At least his form is. So he takes that sword and he just slices the uh, pacifista and it just freezes solid, messes up its circuitry and just psh, critical error has occurred. And then just collapses immediately, all right? Um, and so the pacifista goes down. Um, meanwhile, we have Marcus Mars, who's the Itsumare, the giant bird, flies up to the Labo phase, which I assumed was going to happen because he was the one we saw. We clearly saw he was some kind of bird creature. So I was like, oh yeah, Mars is just going to fly right up to the Labo phase. So as Mars is flying up to the Labo phase, we get a shot, like a bird's eye view down of Egghead. Now Egghead is shaped roughly like a circle. Like the entire island is very circular. We just see Ethan Barron running because all the pacifistas were on the shore. They were at the shores firing, you know, in kind of an order at the battleships. Ethan Barron's just running them down, just boom, 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 just one-shotting pacifistas as he's running by, you know, just, just galloping on his mighty skeletal steed legs, okay? Um, so... Sanji, meanwhile, is relaying all this to Nami, like, I don't know how to describe this. You need to get out of here, like, now. Like, if there's an opportunity for you to get the hell off this island, you need to go. Don't worry about us. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about Luffy. We'll get the hell out of here. We'll figure something out. But you need to go, because there is a actual, literal monster god, devil thing heading straight for you, okay? So just focus on escaping. Don't worry about us. Get out of there, okay? So Marcus Mars flies up to the Labo phase, right where the Frontier Dome is, and seems to just fly right into the dome, and it explodes. But doesn't it doesn't seem like the barrier, um, you know, is is breached or anything like that. We like we don't see the bird go through it. It seems like it just charges the barrier and then just boom, just explodes. Now that's obviously not going to kill Marcus Mars because we've seen the regenerative powers of the Gorosei. Um, so maybe it's like blasts into it and then again and again and again just keeps healing over and over and over again until finally is able to breach the frontier dome. Luffy was able to breach it just by running through it. So I think 
enough times just through sheer force of will. Um, the Itsumade cannot turn intangible, like Marcus Mars is not a Logia, can't turn intangible like Kizuru would move through it, but just push it enough times, it's gonna break through that barrier, okay? Luffy is still fighting Saturn, like Saturn really doesn't miss a beat with this, he's still using his uh, stretchy appendages to like stab Luffy with poison, Luffy's jumping around dodging everything, and then we have uh, Shepard Jupiter as the sandworm diving into the ground next to Luffy, and Luffy's like, whoa! It's digging down like a worm! That's weird! Okay. Then we immediately cut to the Labo phase. Yeah, I know, there's a lot of stuff moving around in this chapter. We cut up to the Labo phase now, where Usopp receives Sanji's message and is like, yeah, don't worry about this, Sanji. We'll be sure to run. You don't have to tell us twice. <laughs> We're gonna get out of here. Don't worry about it, right? Um, they had stopped the Sunny. The Sunny was riding on the ice trail. Uh, Usopp used his bamboo shoot ability with his pop greens, uh, which I guess those work on island clouds, so that's pretty good. So he shoots a pop green and into the island cloud, comes out with the little bamboo shoots, and that kind of, like, stops the sunny so it doesn't skid off the side there. So there's that. They're gonna be okay. Uh, Lilith is like in the background like kicking Brooke, just like, how dare you? We almost died! Brooke's like, it's okay, we didn't. Plus, I've already died once. <laughs> My skeleton sense is tingling. I sense another. <laughs> That'd be cool if Brooke's like, I sense another skeleton on the island. I am the only one. Actually, that would be okay. That would be okay if Brooke could sense that. Because Brooke has the powers of the underworld. Ethan Baron might have the same thing. Ice powers, we've seen it. So maybe Brooke can sense, like, another weird soul that's bound to the living world or something like that. I don't know. Um, Jinbei's there. Jinbei's like, hmm, the situation does sound kind of dire. I should really find Zoro and drag him back by force if necessary. And Sanji's like, yeah, Jinbei, I'm sorry, man. I wish we could help you, but you're all on your own up there. You're the one that's going to have to handle this, right? And so then Jinbei finally arrives at where Zoro and Luchi are fighting. And then Jinbei's like, oh, yeah, I see them finally. Yeah, they're still going at it. And Sanji's like, oh, my God, that damn moss head. What a burden he is. And they're still a ways away, like like Jinbei is a little bit a ways away from the fight with the comms, like hearing Sanji's message, but Zoro still hears it. We see Zoro's ear like flexing when Sanji calls him a burden. So the fight wraps up in one panel here, uh, finally, between Zoro and Luchi. Okay, so Zoro had the Enma knocked out of his hand. Like, Luchi, I guess, hockeyed up his claw and went to go hit Zoro. And Zoro was only using the Enma and the Sandai. The Wado was still on his back. And so it hits one of Zoro's hand. The uh, Enma goes flying up into the air. Then he hears Sanji calling him a burden. And then we have Luchi about to use um, Shigan Madara. It's a technique like spots. It's the same same technique that Who's Who used against Jinbei at Wano, and it was also a technique that he was about to use to finish Luffy off way back at Eni's lobby. Uh, remember, Luffy was in that chibi form, and Luchi kind of like, you know, stuck him in a wall, and Luffy couldn't move because he was a chibi. Remember the chibi Luffy form? That was, yeah, that just kind of ended up. Got it kind of cool if you, that comes back every now and then. But anyway, uh, now we just have shriveled up Luffy whenever he deactivates Gear 5th. Well, anyway, so, um, yeah, Luchi was about to finish him off there, but then his legs gave out from the third gear attack, and so he couldn't use it. And then Zoro also dodges it here. So the only person to land this Shigon spots ability, it's just like a multi-fired multi, multi -fired ability of Shigon. It's like if you have the uh, the claws of a zone, you just like do this like Gatling. Uh, but who's who was able to do it? I guess Luchi just doesn't have enough luck. So in one panel, basically, Zoro grabs the Enma, takes out the Watto, Santoryu, three sword style, spotted leopard, hunt! So it's like an upgraded form of a uh, tiger hunt or tiger trap where he takes all of his three swords, hockeys them up, and slices down Luchi. And that's kind of it. We also see the lightning shootout, so armament hockey, conqueror's hockey, whatever kind of hockey you prefer. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of the fight there. So um, just to talk about that really quick, Look, I'm, I'm just going to state the facts, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just stating the facts here, okay? Zoro used two-sword style this entire fight. And then the moment he's like, all right, I got to end this. Three-sword style finishes it immediately, all right? I'm not saying this is a good thing that Zoro did, but... It seems to me, very apparently, he could have finished this a little earlier. Zoro is one of the Straw Hats that I think understands the status of Yonko more than the others. Like, Luffy does as well. They don't take that title lightly. 
But Zoro definitely understands, like, what it means to be a Yonko crew. I'm a Yonko commander now. So, I don't know, man. Maybe it was a thing where Zoro's going up against Luchi, and he's like, Dude, I'm a Yonko commander. If I go 100% against Luchi, the leader of Cypher Pull Zero, like, my captain was able to finish off Luchi like that. I'm not going, you know, Three sword style Ashura Dead Man's Game against Luchi. You know, I gotta beat him with two swords. Now, is that a good decision? No, it isn't, because we're on a timetable here. I'm thinking it has something to do with Zoro's pride, something to do with Zoro being like, you know, I, I want to prove that I can beat him with two swords. Because he didn't use three until right this moment, and then boom, instantly takes him out. So it seems to imply he could have done this five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, however long this fight was going on for, right? And he just didn't. So, I don't know, I think Zoro, I think, I, th I think he was like hard-moding a video game or something. Like, I could beat this boss with only using a dagger. Sure, we could do that. I'm not gonna use my final ultimate overdrive attack. I'm just gonna use this, you know? Is it a good idea? And you might be sitting there like, oh, bullshit, Tekken. He was struggling. Fine, whatever. He was struggling. I just, like, I, the second he busts out the three swords, he wins. Why couldn't he have done that five minutes ago? It seems like he could have. He just personally chose not to. And this might lead into something. I kind of hope it does. I hope after this is all over and the Straw Hats are safe and they're leaving Egghead, I hope Sanji goes up to Zoro and, like, what the fuck were you doing up there? You know, what were you doing up there? You could have taken that guy out so quick and you decided not to. And Zoro's like, shut up. You think we could go 110% against any small opponent? We're a Yonko crew now. We have standards. Like, screw your standards. I was down there on ground zero when that shit happened. You know, so I hope, I hope it leads to an argument. I hope they talk about this. I really do. Anyway, Zoro beats Luchi. There it is. Okay. Final double page spread of the chapter, all right? Luchi goes down. Uh, there was also, Luchi and Zoro kind of talked a little bit about the hockey downstairs in the fabrication phase. They were like, hey, don't you want to go check out what's going on down there? It's like, yeah, there's a lot of strong hockey popping up, and then the whole thing happened where he cut him down. Um, so Luchi goes down, Luffy's there, and uh, he's in the air, and then Shepard Jupiter appears out of the ground as a sandworm and just, bloop, just eats Luffy. Luffy's like, what? And then eats him. And then you have Dorian Bragi arriving on the scene, charging straight toward the sandworm. It's like, ah, oh, did you see him, Dory? Ah, oh, gaba ba 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 I did, Bragi. Yeah, inside of a sandworm is no place for the likes of the sun god. Let's go. And they use a technique called Child of the Sawing Sun, or just uh, other Taiyo Noko, which is sun saw, is like the literal translation there. Uh, but there could be like a double meaning. So so they go and they just like Whoa! and they use a, a two-pronged attack with their sword and their axe respectively and they just slice the worm in a very similar way that when Luffy was eaten by the Brachiosaur at Little Garden and was falling down the Brachiosaur's throat and then Broggy cut the throat out and then Luffy fell out of it like a giant slide very similar to that so Luffy pops out and he's like yeah I'm out yay <laughs> that was a close one and then you just have Broggy and Dory there like gah, bah, 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 bah. it's been too long, Straw Hat. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had to come to see you. We were getting, it was getting unbearable. And then that's it. That's the end of the chapter. So Luffy got eaten by a giant worm, but it's okay. Dorian Brogy are there. Um, once again, oh, actually, I'm, I'm seeing this now. It wasn't even the same area they cut the sandworm. It's like, so the sandworm is like a worm, right? And so Broggy cut it like here, and then Dory cut it down lower. So like this whole section of worm just fell out. Kind of curious what happens to the sections of the body that get separated. He is a worm. So I'm wondering if the worm is going to like replicate itself. So now there's two worms or something. Or that big chunk of meat they just cut out. Is that just going to hit the ground and just like dissolve like a titan or something? Just like you know or and then it's the other the main body is going to heal back you know how what are the rules here I, I don't really know um but holy shit man i mean like oda didn't need to go that hard but he did we could have just had the chapter being like the the big final is just the goro say showing up all five of them double page spread i would have been satisfied with that and then some other shit going on in the background but he not only did all five goro say in their transformations but he also was like all right no they get to work ethan baron starts eliminating all the freaking pacifistas we have a, a scene here i skipped over it but there is a scene where um one of the marines is like like one of their mechs or their uh, not mechs they're like engineers or something 
there is actually a scene where um, one of the Marines, like, engineers, I guess, or, like, one of their mechanics is, like, looking at the pacifistas and, like, oh, yeah, their circuits were all frozen to the core, so they're, like, paralyzed. They're not going to be able to fight anymore. And all the Marines are just like, oh, whoever this is is on our side. They don't even know who it is. They have no idea who this being is, who, you know, the Gorose have arrived. But holy shit on a biscuit. Okay, um... A lot of people thought it was going to be the God's Knights. I, I saw that. People were like, oh, it might not be the Gorosei. It might be the God's Knights showing up. I was like, no, it's definitely the Gorosei. Honestly, I, I don't know what Oda has planned for the God's Knights. I have no idea. Well, actually, I do. Maybe it was like, man, there's going to be a lot of characters at the end of this battle, like this final war when we get to that. Like, we're going to have, like, yeah, the Marines and the Cypher Poles and stuff uh, and the Gorosei, but, like, there's going to be a lot of allies that are going to need to fight everybody. Like, the Grand Fleet's going to be there. A bunch of other characters are going to be there, too. Maybe Odo was just like, I, I, need, I need more enemies. I need more enemies for people to fight. Sure, we'll do the God's Knights, all right? The God's Knights really do seem like an 11th hour edition that was, like, maybe not originally planned. But whatever. So, I, for right now, I wouldn't focus too much on the God's Knights, okay? Maybe the Straw Hats will fight the God's Knights, but I feel like in some Final War scenario, Straw Hats are going to go up against the Blackbeard Pirates. That's going to be their final opponents. And maybe the fleet will go up the God's Knights, or maybe some other characters. Maybe Doflamingo will fight, like, a Garling or something like that. Who, who knows? But, you know, maybe just to increase the number of enemies that exist, okay? But, man, so Dory and Broggy are on the scene. Uh, who else? Oh, uh, Top Man hasn't done anything. Top Man the boar is just hanging out, like, <laughs> just hanging out, being a, being a boar, I guess. Uh, he is a boar. Yeah, but no, he's there, so, um, we have him, and we have Saturn, and we have Shepard after he regenerates. So we have three of the Gorosei, but it's okay, because we got three on three now. We got Luffy, Dory, and Bragi. I mean, like, it would be interesting if, like, um, you know, uh, not Saturn, but, like, uh, Top Man, like, charges at the Giants, and then Dory just takes out his sword and just, and then just, like, slices the boar straight in half, and just, like, yeah, what the hell was that, and then just pastes itself back together and rushes back at him. I mean, honestly, they could just do a war of attrition because Luffy's Gear 5th does not last forever. The Giants might have a, a, a massive Viking amount of stamina, but that's not going to last forever. If they could just keep regenerating over and over again, Luffy's going to go back into his base form. He's going to be exhausted, and Dorian Bragi might start getting like, Oh, man, no matter how many times we cut these guys, Dory, they don't stay down. Yeah, I know, Broggy. What do we do? And it's just like, yeah, they just keep coming back over and over again. You could just win the fight that way, right? I don't know. But anyway, yeah, crazy. Um, Got to make a video. We're going to break down all the different individual Garase forms and all that stuff, so don't worry. Um, yeah, I think the smart move would just be for Usopp, Brook, Chopper, Lilith, and Nami to just get out of there. Now, I don't know what Zoro's going to do now. If Zoro's like, okay, well, Zoro can fight against Mars. That's probably what's going to happen there. So we can see Zoro battling Mars. Mars is probably going to break through the barrier, get into the Labo phase, and then Zoro and maybe Jinbei will have to hold off this giant bird while Nami and the others get away. Okay, so then we can see Zoro. Now we can see Zoro really trying. He's like, all right, giant bird, okay. Bandana, check. Three swords. Check. Ashura. <laughs> check. You good, Jinbei? Jinbei's like, you know, shark skin, like, charges up his hockey, like, let's go, Zoro. Like, dude, that would be fun to see. So, yeah, Dory Bragi, Luffy fights against three of the Garosei. Jinbei, Zoro fight against uh, Marcus Mars. And then Ethan Baron is just running around the island, just, you know, one-shotting all the pacifistas. That might take him a couple of seconds. Uh, but after he's done with that, he'll probably just come back to the battlefield or whatever, or try to stop the message, try to help Marcus out or something. I don't know. Oh, my God, so much crap to unpack here. All right, well, anyway, that's the video. Hope you all enjoyed, and, uh, yeah, no break next week, so we're just going to keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Let him cook, ladies and gentlemen. Let him cook. And then this is insane when the Gorosei show up. When those young cooks finally make their appearance, it's going to be game over. Strats are done. This is the final arc right here. You thought it was the final saga? Nope, final arc right here. They all die. Planets fall, everybody dies. There it is. All right, later, everyone.